there was a long walk over here with uh, Adam Walk that uh, with uh, Christina and Larry and Bob were looking at each other and saying, well, it's off to a good start. We were saying it's like throwing a party. You know, before it starts, were you wondering if anyone will come? <laughs> and then people show up and it's nice and people are nice and you manage to walk over. So it's sort of like throwing a barbecue, you wonder if it's going to rain. <laughs> And for me, it's very nice also because, as you can see, it's being a very party host where you know all the people come. That's always a pleasure. Um, and so, it's an extra pleasure for me to introduce our keynote speaker this morning uh, because he's one of my friends and colleagues uh, in the field and heroes, in fact, because uh, it was when I was a student in the U.S. studying music and composition and computer music. Uh, that I ran across Michelle Weiss's music. That was back now 20 years ago. I fell across a CD, a compilation of computer music. And this was back in the days when um, computer music still meant to program and code on many different computers, giving a carriage return to let something compile and go out and get a cup of coffee and hope that something fun <laughs> written to a one megabyte piece or something like that. Um, but when I heard this track on this uh, compilation, suddenly the sounds were of computer music, but suddenly somehow it was music again because it was live. It was a uh, it was a CD, so there was no visuals, there was no photos, there was no video, but you could tell that the music was really live. And this really captivated me, uh, and I wanted to know more. Uh, I could just tell that it was being played, it was being performed, and all the things I love to do. The electric guitar and the piano. So the rest is history. I came to Europe. Um, I had the great fortune to come to Lusai and do my own projects, meet Michelle and become friends. And uh, still, uh, he's one of the uh, people that uh, defends uh, this notion. Uh, what we saw a really uh, good example yesterday with Talk Tech uh, that uh, all these digital technologies and wires, cables, and software uh, do become musical instruments, uh, do become things that we can shape. Live ways, and uh, that's what I think uh, is important in this mobile sphere. Uh, we all know how to use our mobile phones, we all imagine music on them. Uh, but how do we start making uh, these sort of uh, live and dynamic interactions with them? This is what really interests me uh, for our field, and so I think uh, it's a very, very um, proper moment uh, to introduce Michelle. Thank you. Thank you, Rafael. Good morning. Um, history, which sort of weaves into the Stein history. So there will be more Stein at the end of this story. And in the beginning, it will be personal and completely, and in the beginning, it will be music. Uh, the focus um, is not about on mobile music. It is, uh, it is really about uh, um, trying to uh, find a relationship or develop a relationship with, uh, with the machines that we use to, to make sound and music. Um, machines is, is a funny word uh, which you will find out during my talk. And uh, the assumption was that, that touching the machines would be you know, something really useful. And so the, the, it has become really like a, a quest and a, a big experience into developing a physical relationship with electronics. And that, of course, relates to the field that you are interested in. Uh, but you will see a lot is not um, yet totally mobile. And some of it is like, is it, you know, like if you look at this, this, of course, is mobile music too. But this is not exactly what you're talking about because you have to make a phone call as well. <laughs> <laughs> and, of course, they're, they're speaking about mobility. If you look at this very early, Receiver. Uh, it was not only very mobile. Uh, it was a crystal receiver, which also didn't use any batteries because it would take the energy from the sphere, so to say, and the signal. Now this is only a receiver for the transmitter. Of course, you need energy. But so somehow, 
we will start with this on stage. And this is for you. And, and for me to remember that I'm at a mobile music workshop. But uh, the focus will be on interfacing and, and the history of that. And even though we're moving into other areas right now, uh, I, I think this is an, an area is like how do you touch you know, your neighbor over a distance? How do you touch sound? And uh, instead of uh, talking too long about it, I will just play for you a little bit. Um, basically, I will be using the same... Uh, I've done this hundreds of times. But I managed to make a stupid mistake. Okay. Um, the software I'm using is called Lisa. Uh, you know, when Max uh, came, which now is Max MSP, we thought it would be nice if not if in music also there's some uh, other gender name like Lisa, but it stands for live sampling. So when the hurricanes got men's names, our software got female names. Um, and um, Lisa was used yesterday also by TopTech. It's, it's originally made for this instrument that exists since 84 in various forms, but I have tried not to change it too much because I'd like to learn to play the instrument. So, although we, we make instruments that are much more refined, um, this still works because, you know, I had, I had, I traveled a lot with it and, and I had it around every day and I could learn to play it. So, uh, what it does basically is I, I can, um, I can speak in, in this microphone. I, I can speak in, in, Thank you. 
it's just a quick improvisation with some of the sounds that I use in sometimes in a more organized form, but also in other in improvisations with other people. Um, I will now uh, show you some images that um, first refer to mobile music in a very Dutch sense. <laughs> this was an army uh, <coughs> bike band. Information that but this goes back uh, to much uh, more recent, but still uh, like in the 60s and the last century, so it's not that recent. It's me and my brother uh, with our parents' uh, piano in the shape that we liked it. Well, they didn't like us anymore after we took away the, the keys, but we noticed that by touching the strings with your fingers or playing that with <coughs> uh, or sticking a trumpet in a bucket with soap, you could get much more interesting sounds. And uh, sometimes they were even taken on the road. This is the same piano, but somewhere in a club in Delft, in Holland. And then uh, there is a, this period where um, I, I was admitted to the, then just started a studio for electronic music at the conservatory in The Hague. Uh, I was literally taken in by the back door by Dick Heimakers, who was a composer running the place. And he let me work with this uh, traditional uh, studio equipment, which was, of course, very tightened to um, um, the room, it could not be brought to concert. So the only thing, I will change the scene, uh, that you could take to a concert was this. And um, so this was the form of mobile music of that time. And, uh, but then you could put it on a machine and, and sit down in the audience and play, and it's still a practice. But I thought of another way of dealing with it, uh, that is to make, uh, be, become the tape player myself. And uh, what you don't see on the image in the front, there is a, a two reading hats. So I'm playing two loops of, uh, with tape sounds, and it's totally similar to what I'm doing now with digital technologies. So I'm moving these tapes, but all of you know that you know moving a tape is like scratching a record. So. Uh, at that time, uh, times were very progressive, so you only wanted to go forward, so you don't want to do real scratching with the record, which is like going forward and backward. So in order to be able to go forward all the time, you, you would use two similar tapes with pedals and would synchronize the output uh, gating. So basically, you could pull forward with one, rewind the other one, not audible to the audience, and pull, back the, pull forward the other one as well. So at that point, you could play continuous sound and then very slowly move through that loop. The tape recorders on the ground were done to do live sampling. So the tape had to be put on those two recorders and you would sample, put it back on the thing and play with it. So that was used quite, uh, for quite a while at the end of the 60s to, as you can see of my dress code, um, it was the end of the 60s and to do concerts. Then at some point, there's a British company that brings out a little synthesizer, and the great thing about that synthesizer is that you could use it without a keyboard. The keyboard for me was something, uh, as you've seen on the piano, that was not very useful. With sound, if you would be interested in sound, there's this kind of thing that you, know, you would rather navigate than just choose. And the, the whole idea of a keyboard comes from, you know, from church uh, music in, in, in West European society. And, uh, and there was all, all, all those connotations of something, well, that's not really mine. And, and synthesizers were nice, but you couldn't really you know, navigate them too. But this one had a nice uh, possibility um, because you could open the back and stick your fingers in the back and become sort of a thinking part of, of this instrument. Because if you would touch one wire, the electricity would potentially be on your body. And if you would touch another place on that circuitry, you would connect those places and sort of extend the circuit. And by that, you could really change the sound in a very nice way. So this whole idea, uh, again, a very typical 60s case, comes from making uh, an LSD trip at some point, where indeed, you know, and it was Jimi Hendrix, of course, uh, the sound would be floating in space in the room, and I was able to touch the sound and really manipulate the sound. I, I would be able really to grab it and, and it would change the sound and it was totally real. 
And of course, that was such an intense experience that, that you know, all these means are still a little bit vague. And, uh, but you know, as you can hear, there is some possibilities with it. But this is the start of it. So instead of um, opening the back every time, I would add uh, little wires to that patch panel and instead of patching it with pins, I would have these little cushions uh, where, that I would use to connect my fingers. So I would um, become a thinking part of this, uh, this instrument. I will show you instruments that have been built later. But this is actually the first uh, attempt to build such an instrument that was later called the crackle synths. And basically, there are very simple analog circuits that allow you to change the circuitry with uh, body conductivity. Something that, by the way, is now uh, completely patented by Microsoft, and they could make us stop um, selling those little devices now. Um, <clears throat> so a concert in, in early 70s, like this is a, a very early concert in the Roundhouse at the ISIS Festival, which was one of the first live electronic music festivals in Europe with John Cage also, was quite a lot of American presence as well. And you see in the back, there is, there is um, the, the puppy synthesizer, there's the two tape recorders for doing live sampling. There is that, that tape system, the playback, and on my knee I have that crackle, early crackle synth. And this is another, and this is another way, and you see there's some mobility here by putting the loudspeaker uh, on, around my shoulder and uh, like selling peanuts. And um, with batteries inside and a crackle sim on top, I could go into the whole audience, which at that time for electronic music was never produced. And this is actually a, a little overview of the first uh, prototypes. Uh, that, and this is an exhibition later at the Art Museum here in Amsterdam, the Static Museum. And this is an art school where I was allowed to experiment on the students. It was called teaching at that uh, in another way. But here, what's interesting is that you see the person in the back is playing a theremin, which is you know, one of the first instruments uh, of electronic music that really dealt with the body. Uh, basically, it's two aerials, you, you probably know it, and, um, and you move your hands and you change with the capacity, the electric capacity of your body. You can change uh, the tone and the loudness, and so sort of to do a kind of uh, imitation of a, a singing soul. And uh, Leon Theremin performed with symphony orchestras, and, and you know, there's beautiful documentation about it. But here you see the person in the back is playing the theremin, but also using the person in front of him as an extension of that capacity, while that person is playing a cracker box and touching another person playing another cracker box. Uh, this was like very early ensemble work, and we're speaking probably 72. Uh, this is theatrical use of, of those principles. I will not go into too much detail. Uh, in 73, I arrived at Stein and, and thought uh, it would be nice to build an instrument based on this principle and make it available for more people. And uh, actually, we never advertised for it and, and built around uh, 4,000 at that time, and they made it to many places. And, uh, and we're we, this is the first time we, as a laboratory, we have done like electro action or retro activity. So this is the new cracker box, as we said now. And uh, this was uh, really uh, a present for a lot of kids, and it's interesting because a lot of those kids uh, came later to work at Stein. So you know, be really careful what kind of toys you give your kids. And. Uh, so that is the, the crackle box. And based on the same principle of conductivity, so you're patching, you're controlling, you're interacting with the circuit. We, we did try to make one keyboard. It was a, as a singer-actress who, who really wanted to be able to play chords and accompany herself. So basically, each key is one crackle box. So this is a very polyphonic keyboard. And we built only one. It's still here. And, uh, and it could, you know, do really kind of, uh, you know, like old-fashioned organ sounds. But then, if you would move your fingers a little bit more on the other little patch, it, it would get very noisy, but very uh, good to interact with. And this was the crackle synth um, that was my personal instrument and designed to, indeed, uh, go with on the road. So, so indeed, this is like 
developed in the, in the mid 70s, and um, it had a loudspeaker, and you would simply connect it. The amplifier would be in here, and the batteries are in there, and basically it had some sort of a keyboard, and each key can be tuned separately. Well, you see the contact is not that good, the tuning is a bit different, but... something that may be fatter than a laptop, but plays very <coughs> juicy. So that is the, the, the crackle synth, uh, of which we, we built uh, maybe just 30. And um, I, I traveled quite a lot with it. And uh, you see some details of another one. That's not this one, but it's a similar idea. This is how it would be played. It would stand on a, on a little three-point stand. And you see there is a loudspeaker in front that normally is used on, in ice skating rings. I used to play also with uh, early pioneers of the, the free improvisation movement, like Peter Brutzmann and Willem Blaviger and Evan Parker. And they were very noisy. So I, instead of using a, a very nice, uh, warm loudspeaker, I sometimes would go on the road with this ice ring speaker and it would be able to be very loud as well. And uh, here you see a combination of that ice ring speaker, and I'm sitting on battery-powered speakers, uh, and you see a microphone in front of it, and this would have a much warmer sound. So you see this is all also geared to traveling. This is another aspect of mobility. For us, it, a lot of the people were traveling, you know, composers and musicians, and we needed to, to make things smaller in order to be able to travel ourselves and go to the gigs. This is the changing of the batteries. And this is a gig at the Murs Festival, like a, an open air, big open air festival, with the Putnam synthesizer <laughs> and the crackle scene. And this is uh, in itself, for you, probably not very exciting to see, but at that time, uh, this is mid 70s still, it was quite um, something that this, this is in Stockholm, in the film studio, and they gave me the studio for free, and I recorded a, a record, which is called Crackle. And the idea that you would be the, the engineer, the, the, you know, the recording engineer, the player, the composer, and editor all in one, now is totally normal. But at that time, you were hardly ever allowed to touch the knobs in a studio. You know, that was the domain of somebody else. It was totally not mobile. You, you, you were really not allowed to touch it. So this idea that, that all these roles could be put in one person and that they would leave you alone in the studio, in the mid 70s was still something really special. And now with our laptops, we have it all on our lap. Now, this is Stein uh, on the road for the first time. Uh, Stein had this workshop where we were building all these little equipments, uh, like I just showed you a few. Uh, but this is all the prototypes. And there was a, a, a guy in the South Hall who had a gallery and said, well, uh, the children really like to play with this, we assume. So we made the first uh, crackle exhibition and we really literally carried out the gear from the prototypes from the workshop and brought it uh, into that little gallery. And a lot of those exhibitions followed. And to the pleasure of uh, a lot of children, I may say. But also for us, it was a wonderful way to experiment and see how people, especially children, were not impressed by you know, technological effects, but they just wanted to work somehow. So for us, it was very good to see if what we were building was intuitive enough uh, to be understood, and, and children through the year, because we still do this, uh, proved to be very good beta testers for music instruments and sound instruments. This is in France, and also you can see a very stiff dress code that the uh, recent victory of this new president in France might come back. <laughs> and uh, this is an other instrument where basically the, the person is holding a little oscillator that responds to light. So this is one of the few times that we were score-based. So the light box has all kinds of patterns, and by moving that little pipe in front of it, it's reading the patterns. But of course, you can move it in front and, and read it any direction you want. So 
So also this idea of having the composer producing a score and the musician, uh, you know, sort of uh, bringing that score into the world was something that disappeared quite quickly in this electronic music scene. And because composers and musicians, you know, became one, it also quite often symbiotically in one person. And so that's why there's only one keyboard and one score in this show, or presentation, sorry. Uh, in the back here, the, the pictures are the only ones that remain from that time, but uh, they, they, that's why some of them are not very good. But the, the one in the back shows you the crackle uh, idea, but, but brought into little bowls. So you could hold a bowl and have four people holding each of them and touching each other. Very touchy-feely, very 60s. And, um, but it would make sound. And this is the same idea, but for four people, and sort of, you, would, you don't see it very well, but it has little wires, and you can hold uh, the wire, and then you, you connect yourself to one of the speakers above. On the floor, you see little dots, that, and each of the dots has a specific sound. And again, you, so you have to also now take off your shoes and stand there with, uh, and with four other people. And these people were sometimes, you know, hugging each other, and hanging and, and the sound would not be really romantic as you have heard from the crackle day one. But people would really like it and just, you know, touch each other and make sound. And this is a version for two people, like a more mobile version, but again, it's all battery powered. And this is how it was used with the singer actress that I mentioned before. And this is the still a relatively decent part where we would only touch our faces. And the, the rest is not photographed. I would show you otherwise. But this is the same exhibition that I mentioned before in the State Museum in Amsterdam, where on, you see on the right there is a, 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 a room constructed, and everything was electrified. Outside, of course, was the bicycle, but this bicycle had uh, was a very uh, <coughs> mobile music instrument. Uh, it had uh, all the um, so the, the dynamos, um, the generators were not connected to light, but each generator was simply wired to a, a, a speaker. So it was like six generators and six speakers, and it, it really was like a, a big truck would come into a street, and we had like four of them. And it was really beautiful sound and, and really wild. So this is that, that space, the room, where you have all the objects, like you pick up the phone and you say hello, and your voice comes back, but totally distorted, depending on how much you squeeze the phone. And there's more detail here. There's a, a Swiss cuckoo's clock that basically ticks. My, my mother was from Switzerland, so there's a bit of a personal story behind it. Uh, but it, every second scratches a wire with electricity past other wires. So it's, the, the speakers make a really scratchy sound. It really ticks very electrically, very pure electronic sound, I would say. And but there's a feedback. And of course, when the cuckoo comes out now, then it, it run way faster than, you know, it was one hour and 50 minutes. So the cuckoo would come out very often, but it would really cause incredible feedback and, and noise. And kids liked it very much, and they found out how you could pull up the batteries that were used as waves. This is another principle that uh, you, you stick uh, a pen on a speaker, and that speaker has a conductive surface. The pen is connected to a battery, that again, via the back of the speaker, is connected to that surface on the speaker. So when you touch the speaker with the pen, the speaker will pull out and throw away the pen. So when you hold the pen lightly, like this woman does, it will, it will become like a rhythm box. It was one of the first analog or electromechanical rhythm boxes, you could say. And that, that was the radio. So this was like a local radio only. And you could have your own beat. So this is a candle. This was not a sound insulation. In, the harder you would blow, the more light would come. But as you see, the guy is standing in front of a mental piece, and it would have a little heater, and uh, the heater would start to become very warm while the person was blowing the candle. So they, they sometimes would burn their knees, well, not really, but you know, it was a very strange experience. Also, you see there's a little Marguerite reference, the painter, the Belgian painter Marguerite. There's a train now then coming uh, past his uh, collar, you could say. And that was a little electrical train. And of course, some brave guys uh, would uh, not hesitate to t pull the, the little train out of the rail. And, uh, and then they didn't know that behind that decorum was a huge loudspeaker system 
and a very old-fashioned, severe uh, uh, master of the station would scream, put back that train! <laughs> and they would like feel the most horrible kid would put it back immediately. Very interesting study in security. <laughs> <laughs> Here you see our crackle uh, system. Uh, based on the same idea, we made a crackle jail where each bar has a contact and uh, you, you lock yourself up and it really locks and it will only open when you found the right combination. And uh, so you would find people really searching quite a long time. <coughs> guys very interestingly staring at it. And uh, it was amazing to see how many people locked themselves in and luckily got out. The, the, the people that were in the exhibition to guard had a secret code. It was used daily a few times. This is a very interesting uh, for interface designers. This looks like horror. This was actually part of an exhibition. And you can imagine when this exhibition was brought to the Science Center in Amsterdam, that the people there were like, so you, you're not going to exhibit this, are you? This is children coming in, you know, children from all neighborhoods in Amsterdam. We said, yes, yes. Well, then they told us a story that the, the mercury capsule that had just traveled around the Earth several times with the first space travelers in duo, um, came back through the world's atmosphere or into the world's atmosphere. It had these beautiful little um, ceramic tiles at the bottom, so it didn't burn. It, it all made it, all the tiles were there, but it was exhibited for the first time outside of the United States in Amsterdam, in this museum, and within a week those children indeed <laughs> had removed half of the tiles as souvenirs. <laughs> Uh, you know, asked by their parents. So why was this so interesting? Is that basically this is a very simple uh, musical instrument. You pour the tea, and again, the tea itself becomes a conductor. So since the pot and the cups are connected to a crackle synth, which you see in the back, by pouring tea, you can make melodies and, and funny rhythms by having the, 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 the pouring tea being uninterrupted. But of course, the great pleasure for the kids was to pour the tea over the crackle synth itself. And it, it was quite a wild instrument, and it, got, and it was so fragile that you would see a very funny behavior in that same museum where these kids were destroying a lot of stuff. They would be really trying to repair. There's a story that one guy came back with his own little boy, came back with his father, and they brought a soldering iron, and they asked where they could connect it. I mean, if you, so, so this whole idea of, you know, making, um, at least in, in Holland there's an expression now, when you make a new interactive museum, it has to be hüft or proof. Basically, it means asshole proof. <laughs> Slightly more decent translation. And, um, it, 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 and it means making it stronger and stronger. And in a way, this proves, you know, that if you make things very fragile, Sure, it will be destroyed, and maybe kids will repair it, but you can repair it probably easy as well. But it will invite for a different relationship. So, so this has been for us a quite interesting uh, experience in dealing with, you know, how strong do you make your stuff. Well, of course, if you think about tea, you can make uh, uh, plates and, and the rest. And this was then, at that time, the ideal crackle family of the future. <coughs> People don't know that it's given that has traveled the whole world. If anyone knows that. Um, I'm showing this one. Um, this is not a theatrical uh, thing where you see things on the table. I'm basically showing it for, for this little detail, which is uh, the marionette that is sitting on, on, the, on the synthesizer. By the way, this is uh, a piece called Jazz in the Morning. Well, if anything jazz is, it's not in the morning. But it was with one of the great ones of jazz. On the right side, you see Steve Lacey. And it was uh, me on the left side in, in Morning and Down, and together with Martin Altman, composer. And we did music theater pieces uh, that were sometimes quite hilarious, but also very uh, trying to mix with different uh, scenes. And this was then jazz and electronics. But the reason I show this is that the marionette um, encounter with marionettist was very important because. In fact, we were both working with something in our hands and wires and something dead at the end of the wires of uh, this instrument that you try to bring alive. And marionettists, um, you know, have a, in, we found out because it's such an old, uh, old profession that they had all these, these stories about how they relate with their marionettes. We got in touch with, with later, actually, in, in the 80s and 90s, 
with people from the Institut La Marionette in Charles de Mezières, which was a quite progressive institute at that time. Also, Sally J. Norman was connected with it and brought this thing again. And we had long discussions with marionettes or people or, and marionettes <laughs> and in that time. And this whole idea of, you know, the, the marionettes would say, you know, like they have this little piece of cloth and, and they study for ages, you know, like in, in, in having, you know, unborn marionettes, so I can only fake it, but, you know, they sit there and they, they know how, how, how it falls. You know, they study for hours and hours and they look, oh, no, this is not sad enough. And suddenly when these people do it, it comes alive, you know, it's a nun and it's, it is somebody died and, you know, like, well, in me it's still a shirt, um, but, but you understand what I'm talking about. And they were very, they really pointed out how much their, you know, their things were alive. And there was this guy who told me, um, you know, one night these, these puppets, they don't want to play work with me. They're, they're really, so he really had gone into this totally animist state where they were alive and, and assuming that would help to focus. And it's true that, you know, when, when I was doing music, uh, I realized, you know, it's totally similar. Those, those electronics, they aren't machines anymore. If you stand on stage, and you think there are machines, you're lost. Because then you think about parameters, about numbers, about things that are not, not visible at all. So this idea that you create a, a bond, that, an interaction with your dead objects, and whether it's real or not, it doesn't matter. It helps terribly with concentrating. I mean, pianists, traditional pianists, also do these things, you know, like these huge movements to just press a key. They could just press the key instead of doing this, you know. And it's like Stanislavski, who tells his old theater students in building a character, that's the name of the book, you know, that if you walk, it's not just stepping, it's, it's really what happens in between. So this stuff is also about connecting, you know, like the piano player who does that movement. In romantic music, it's almost like describing the romantic emotion, you know, like, ah, you know, that's why modernists, you know, can do this typing. And, uh, you know, there's, there's a lot there that is, quite often overlooked completely when you design an instrument or you think about interfaces. And uh, this is another type of interface, which is a fencing rod, uh, traditional fencing rod, but connected to a welding transformer and to a microphone. So you can imagine the noise it made. And the beautiful thing was that at the end, when you stuck together, they really start melting on the ground. And if, if the electricity then is turned off for our safety, there you really stuck together in a beautiful, a peaceful way. So it was also part of theater. This is another a piece that I did uh, in the time of the Queen's uh, crowning. Uh, this was like a big anarchist period in the Netherlands with lots of riots, and I did a piece called the Anarchist Ball. And of course, we needed an arm that is a music instrument. And this is like a sort of violin machine uh, crackle box where you would touch the strings and make all these sounds. And um, just to give you some like, examples of use of that, those ideas. This was uh, um, actually a robot play that followed uh, from all these things. This is like, uh, there's people inside of some, I won't go into too much detail, but uh, it was, a, 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 the robots were later, later used very much as performers, and this is on the square in Bologna. Uh, just, uh, I, I was doing a concert in a, in a program with Ryan Eno, and since you know he was the big uh, star, I, I, I felt I had to do something to make myself seen. So I started doing my concert with uh, this robot that would basically transmit my music within the audience and and like really run around and, and scare people or like, invite them to dance. It was really a very nice um, conclusion of that period. Uh, <clears throat> I will try to move a little bit quicker now. This is um, this is like. Uh, 80s when MIDI has been designed and so suddenly we are in the digital age and uh, with, with, with that I mean in the age where digital technology made it on stage because of course you're in music you have digital technologies already in the 50s and 60s but it was like totally bound in, in spaces where you couldn't go it couldn't be mobilized and to go somewhere else so the only uh, thing was recordings. So this is the idea that if you have a MIDI, which basically is this protocol that lets you control, uh, play one keyboard with another, uh, so that you know with one keyboard basically you could play in a whole orchestra of keyboards or synths at that time. 
So I thought if you can produce those, those uh, codes uh, with another device, uh, that would be very interesting because then you can still make all these sounds, but with something that is more suited to, to my personal needs, to, so I can move and, and do things. So this is like the first version of that instrument. And um, this is a second. I, I'm sorry, you don't see much detail. And this is the version that you've been seeing here today. I'll skip it quite quickly because you can see it here if you're interested. We'll leave that here. And in terms of mobility, it was nice because I presented this instrument often at shows and conferences. And indeed, there was a, at some point a French uh, friend. I found this in a shop in Grenoble. It turns out it's an American company. And we, we found out there was indeed a guy that was present at the exhibition and stole the idea immediately. And uh, so I'm very happy to. Uh, and so uh, there's a, a more mobile version of this instrument. <coughs> so then the, the, this whole technology that we developed at Stein which is based on what, what was called the center line, or still is called the center line. That is this little box, which basically takes sensors as an input, which can be keys, accelerometers, uh, pressure, uh, all kinds of combinations also. And then that inside this box, it can be uh, translated into MIDI code. So basically, um, this is a very important uh, part of the chain we discovered, because a lot of people still these days, now that it's so much easier to do this stuff with Max MSP and, and the units that you can buy and shop, uh, a lot of people still send their, their information straight from the sensors into you know, some kind of variable in some kind of piece of software for sound or music. And we discovered that you know, this whole thing of effort uh, is crucial. What happened in the 50s and 60s when people for the first time were able to work with computers, they thought, ah, that's, we should do music as well. So they thought, well, what is, what is numbers? What is computers? So they thought of Buck. And they put in uh, a, you know, a Buck score in, a, in an old computer in the 50s, and it played like you know, our, the worst telephone we still have hanging around, like really not musical. It did the melodies, it did the chords, but something was wrong. So they thought, well, people don't play it so precisely as the computer. So they added this, this little routine in the program that would play it more sloppy in time. So you know it would not be perfectly on time like they thought people were. But then still, it sounded you know weirder and definitely not more musical. And this is when we started working on this stuff. We realized that you know this this little deviation in time because pitch you can hear. You have to be very precise with pitch. But the little deviation in time apparently tells something very musical. It's not just you know, a little bit of information that is not precise. Now maybe there's information in, in this like little trembling of a hand or you know, the, the, the pressure thing that is very crucial. So we did experiments where we, did, um, we made a huge handle because at that time your synthesizers would have a pitch band wheel. And you can do a glissando with a pitch band wheel. Like if you have a symphony orchestra playing a glissando, you know, like all the instruments that can play this on the all together, it's an incredible effort. It's a mental effort, it's a physical effort, and it's really something is happening that is deep, you know, uniting people and there are you know focused. It's quite impressive. So when you have a synthesizer and somebody takes his or her tongue and just moves that that wheel, you can sort of get somewhere near, but it doesn't sound musical. So we thought, why don't we make a huge handle, you know, with big friction plates and connect it to the, that, that same part of the, the circuit as the pitch band wheel, and then you pull that same glissando. And it was very interesting because you did, we discovered that um, if you would play that back uh, on tape, so people couldn't see where it would come from, people would all experience the, the big handle as a more musical uh, you know, glissando. So this, this really showed that whatever the cause is, if you have a very direct sensor relationship uh, you know, between your body and well-chosen parameters of your sound, you, something will be transmitted that, that tells you it's music. 
And this probably has to do with you know how a person manages effort. And so it's not about you know who is the strongest and the strongest will make the best music or something like that. It is about you know how does a person deal with you know difficult you know like sitting for hours like this or you know making like how do people uh, interact with those instruments? And and it's not like you know it's not even mastery. It is you know like everyone who plays a violin knows that uh, it takes 10 years or so to understand what a string does. Because a string is not something you just control. And this whole idea of controllers, the naming of this, is really ridiculous. That, uh, I think the best we can be is that we interact with it, that we you know, engage ourselves in, in being in touch somehow with, with the sounds and with, with the material. And that, that comes from you know, literally being in touch and feeling these little, you know, feeling the life of a string, for instance. A violinist uh, really learns to, to know that a string, you know, will not move right away if you change direction. You have to do that in a very specific way. And, it, and, and the string has really a lot more life of its own than people pretend, you know. And other people will tell, oh, they really master their instrument well, but a musician knows, you know, that it's, it, you do this together. And this in electronics, we had to kind of construct. Because in electronics, you can make something totally effortless. You can make a little sensor that you just wave your hand at, and it makes an incredible amount of noise. There is no physical relationship. Like a clarinet player holds the air in her hands and, and, and really moves it. And, and, you know, like a drummer is beating and it's it's all you know you're in touch with the instrument with the with the sound producer itself. With electronics, there is a possibility. There's a church in Holland that accepts the carillon, accepts MIDI code. So basically, I can be sitting here and play that those church bells from here without a physical relationship, without even hearing it, which maybe is a bit difficult. But anyway, so this allows you to to program that relationship, and that is very interesting. And this is what happened in the center lab. And this is an area that no matter how much effort has been made to work with centers by so many people, is still totally in underdeveloped. The whole, people call it mapping sometimes, there's, there's, but, but it's, it's totally building a relationship. And I will get back to that. But, so by, by making instruments like you see here, uh, for other people as well, we started building up, you know, a kind of vocabulary, and, a, and a, you could form a library of different uh, ways of using these sensors. This is John Rose, originally from Australia, putting lots of sensors and sonars in his bow, and, uh, and by moving the bow uh, in, in proximity of a, of a, of a receiver <coughs> on stage, he could also add effects to his cello and violin player. This is somebody who didn't want to have a violin anymore. Uh, it's an Austrian musician, and, and, but he wanted to do the movements, but using sonars that we built for him, and then playing electronic sound with it. This is Nick Collins, uh, who was artistic director at Stein for a little while, teaching in Chicago at the moment, and he has this trombone with, where the air is not coming from him, but from the electronics, but he's using the slider to, uh, to change all kind of data structures. And this is Edwin van der Heide, who played one of our early uh, uh, models of this. Uh, there's a simpler version of this instrument that was made for educational purposes, and he, he took it from the conservatory in The Hague, where he worked with Atao and, and uh, Zbigniew Karkowski, the sensor band that used them, with really great results. This is Leticia Sonami, who uses the same um, um, sensor lab on her back, as you see, and with what she calls the ladies' glove. And which has all kind of flex sensors and accelerometers. So all these people contributed to to you know, development of what is inside the sensor lab, which is a, a very uh, refined way of translating your movements into sound. Uh, I did some collaborations also to to find out you know how you can uh, how it works to have such an instrument on stage. This is with Laurie Anderson. This is with uh, Najib Shiradi. This is actually Lev Fairman, the, the inventor of that, uh, that instrument that I showed in the beginning. He has been here at Stein, and 
I stand there with sheepies. Uh, <laughs> you know, it's such, it was such an honor to meet the man and, and play together. And this was just before he died, unfortunately. And he tried my instruments, of course, because I was a show of hands. And paid respect. Um, <clears throat> I'm getting now to the last phase. That is, um, that is really, we're now moving into a Stein project. Um, the, I've been mentioning this sensor idea where you work with a combination of sensors, but still, um, the, to feel the texture, you need a great sensitivity. But how do you obtain that? Is it just one sensor, or do you need many sensors? And for a while, and, and as you saw in previous examples, we've gone into this idea that you use many sensors. And uh, it's only later, under the influence uh, of the ideas of Christina Anderson, when she showed up here, that we start researching what you could do with just one, a single sensor, which has been really useful too. But here you still see us in, in the area of very complex sensors. And so the, the idea is that, that, you know, sound is very complex. So if you want to change the sound, and if you want it to be really alive, you probably don't, you, you don't switch at all like a light. You, you really want to be in touch with many aspects. So one day, I was looking out of the window, I saw a spider web, and then I thought, well, if each thread in that web is a, is, is a sensor that could be connected, you know, even to a mixing table, you can imagine by grabbing that web and changing the whole structure, uh, you would like be able to, to, to play a mixing table with maybe 48 uh, uh, faders with just a single hand movement. And so we start to build these very simple webs. This one actually is now in the Science Museum in London. And, and the last time I was there, I wasn't allowed to touch it anymore. I was very frustrated. <laughs> and, uh, and, but this is a very simple one that has uh, just a few wires that are attached to these pressure sensors. And, uh, and already with that, you could really uh, touch a lot of sounds in a much more deeper way. This is a version that is upstairs, uh, as Stein. you might have seen it or you might be able to see it. It's a much more refined version. The wires are very thin, and you can grab with both hands and move it. You will see it back in other pictures, and <coughs> like this one. So this is uh, at, a, at a more recent uh, version of our exhibition, the same web, where people play for hours by changing these pressures. And the good thing of this instrument is that you don't have to know anything of the circuit that's behind. You can played in a very intuitive way. And of course, this is also used for, for VJ and, and, and image photography. That is not mentioned before, but it's an important aspect. This is uh, Atau uh, during his workout uh, quite a few years ago. Uh, this was called the net band, if I'm right. Or the sound band. Uh, sound band, sorry. <laughs> and uh, so this is the same idea uh, of that web. And, um, and, uh, but here, the weight of the players is changing the, the sensors. And this is a, a version like we had in the exhibition. This was definitely made for children to play with. Um, each thread has an animal sound. And uh, the, once you touch the thread, it, you hear that sound. But once you start pulling the thread, uh, it will morph slowly into a, a, a human being imitating that animal. So kids would be really suddenly fascinated by pulling the wire instead of, you know, just grabbing it and pulling it. They, they would really try to find out, oh, no, is it, is it the man or is it the animal? And, and it was in the educational center very interesting to see and play. Also older people. And, and here in the back of it, you see another version of such a, a web. Um, the web started, uh, we started making them in 88, just before the, the World Wide Web came. And uh, the one in the back is called the TP band. And here the, the wires are, are in a vertical position. And the good thing of this one is it, you can each grab the wire, so you can play it with, uh, with several people. And basically, if, if nobody touches a wire, you don't hear anything. As soon as you touch a wire, uh, sounds will start. So there is a little process running, but you can really, by, by pulling that wire, change the rhythms, or so sometimes one, they, they work in pairs. One changes the rhythm. And the other one changes the filtering, for instance. And those are very simple setup. They're, they're really made for schools as, as an experience to you know, discover yourself. And it doesn't need explanation. Some people do it alone or together. And sometimes we put all the kids and, and make fun with them. 
So uh, there's a few more interfaces that I would like to show. Um, this is a, a very early table, like the table uh, metaphor has been used a lot now and, and probably a lot better. But what made this one uh, very interesting for us is that we had these few objects that made, uh, that were representing, uh, you know, like a piano or a drum and a trombone. And basically the position on that glass uh, was defining uh, what kind of note it would play. And basically you would go through a little blues scheme uh, by moving from left to right. And the piano would do the chords in the same way. And, uh, and the drummer would do like a variation song on little grooves. And so it was very simple. It was very easy to understand. This is the total opposite of you know, the very complex installation. You touch something, you don't know what happens. And, and, but you have the feeling you're outside of it. And this is like too simple almost. You understand it immediately. But interestingly enough, we saw kids that would play for hours because the combinations are, are so multiple. So you, you can really, uh, in a combination of this, find ways to, to, to explore. And of course, the kids would come at school and in the weekend bring their parents and they would explain and the parents would not really understand it. It was very nice, like a good generation. This is a, a keyboard and uh, the third keyboard that we built, and this is about uh, the relationship be between like touch, like the surfaces of each key uh, have like a, a particular quality. Uh, some of it, you know, it's like nails, there's little tin that does drumming, there's marble that makes cracking stones, there's a tapestry that makes very muffled sound, there's a bell, there's a, a fake dog turd that feels very ugly and, and produces, of course, a very ugly sound. And you see a handle in the back in the left where, again, you could switch or move between this sort of semi-original associated sound towards uh, a human being, again, imitating this sound, so giving a more emotional rendering of what you feel. And, it, of course, this creates a big discussion with the kids, if, it, if the renderings were correct or not. And, but at the same time, they would play together and, um, and create all these... Uh, there was kind of a few loops in there, so that would also attach people to it. So we get now to more recent instruments, where, um, where in this case, the headphone has the accelerometer, so this is all mobile, but it's still connected to a computer system. Uh, this is part of an exhibition, just for technical information, where we use Minimax, and like one Minimax runs about like six installations. And uh, so this is one of them, and it's a headphone with an accelerometer inside. Again, totally simple. You put the headphone on, and by the movement, music starts. It's, it's a kind of uh, jungle type, uh, well, techno for people who are outside it, but it's, it's more like rhythmical in, in, a, in a really syncopated, uh, more African way. It's not electronic sound, it's a very strange mix of acoustical sound. So it has a, like a, an acoustical feel. But when you put the headphone on, you notice very quickly that when you move your head, the music falls the way you move your head. And so, you know, people start shaking their head and shaking. It's totally simplistic. But the interesting thing is that within a minute, the most self-conscious person forgets there's people around watching them. So it's, it's especially beautiful for the other people to see these people standing there and not dancing in a way that you know shows their beauty. Now they're totally <laughs> inside with their eyes open and forget everything. It's a beautiful thing. We, we really want to make one with like 20 in one hole, but then maybe people become aware of it. I don't know. But the other thing is that once you start doing a kind of regular thing, the music will start following your beat. And then people really start, you know, like slowing down and getting nauseous after a while. And it's a very, again, very simple but effective. Cracker boxes, we always put them back in the exhibition. This is uh, also from the mid, right, say, mid late 90s. Uh, it's a chair that has like very powerful low uh, frequency speakers. So you can imagine that uh, we, we start using game controls also to, to interact with sound. So the person inside the chair can put on a headphone and start playing with that game controller and you get totally massaged. It is very uh, tricky. It can be very exciting if you're open for it. For other people, it can be really scary because it really vibrates into your spine. Uh, we checked with people who, who, told, who were knowledgeable and told us like it shouldn't be dangerous, but we sometimes would keep, uh, help take people out of the chair if they would like really stay there totally almost paralyzed in kind of little, you know, hand, uh, brain, body loops. But they 
as you see, uh, people were waiting in line to uh, sit on it and be massaged. A more recent version is this is made by, by Kev Matthews uh, from England. Uh, she has made a bed where, where 